The knowledge of men is especially difficult for two reasons. First, because it cannot be learned from books. And that is one that I know drives people crazy and it, and it drives me crazy. And also he will go and kind of reverse that a little bit because he does talk about how military men should study history because you do learn what to expect. But to say that knowledge of men is especially difficult for two reasons. First, it cannot be learned from books. And I think we've all seen that. You know, when you get somebody that's been through some kind of a leadership academy and they try and do this doctrinalized book <laughs> solution for something mm -hmm. and, and, and they fail with it. Mm -hmm. Second, because the characteristics of the individual in peace are completely changed in war. Now, I agree with him on this with a caveat because, you know, he's saying that the way men react in war is completely different from the way they react in peace. And I would venture to guess that if he was alive and I was to have this discussion with him, he would agree with what I'm about to say. It is not that their reactions are completely changed. It is just that their reactions are amplified and intensified. And that is something that Leif and I talk about all the time. When people ask us about in civilian companies, you know, it's different because it's not combat. And we say combat is like life. It's just amplified and intensified. So when you have some business leader that's nervous about making a decision because they might lose a bunch of capital or set the company up for a, you know, a bad quarter or whatever, and that's, that's real. That's real emotion. It's real fear. It's real hesitation. All you do in combat, you put somebody in a combat leadership position and they have to make a decision where it could cost someone their lives or could cost them, cause mission failure. It's the same emotions, but it's just amplified. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think that Von Schell would agree with me if he heard that explanation. I think occasionally you get at the top end of intensity, you do get some other emotions, you know, you get people to freeze. But then again, I see people in the business world that freeze when things get too complex or too crazy, people freeze and they become paralyzed and they don't make a decision because they're too scared. So actually I would stick to my guns on this and say that the reactions, although different, they're the same reactions. They're just amplified. He goes on, man reacts differently in war than he does in peace. Therefore, he must be handled differently. For this reason, we cannot learn in peacetimes the psychology of war. Again, I will tell you that the training that we put together when it was intense enough, we would get to see in a micro way. We'd get to see the beginning of those reactions that, that guys would deliver in war. It is my belief that no one can give a prescription for a correct application of the principle of psychology in war. The only thing of which we are certain is this. The psychology of the soldier is always important. No commander lacking in this inner knowledge of his men can accomplish great things. That I would agree with. You have to understand your people. And I would go one step further and say you not, have to not just understand your people that work for you, you need to understand the psychology of the people that are above you in the chain of command. Understand what's driving them. Understand what kind of decisions they're making and why they're making those decisions. As long as armies were small and the battlefield narrow, a leader could exert psychological influence on his army by personal example. In modern wars, however, the high commanders are necessarily far in the rear and the majority of the soldiers never even see them. Consequently, the task of influencing and understanding the soldier psychologically has, in large measure, passed to subordinate commanders. 